Hey everyone, today I want to talk about the missing dinosaurs of North America. Now, I know what you all are thinking. Really, Napkin? Missing dinosaurs in North America, aka the Hollywood of Dinosauria? Come on! North America is home to the T-Rex, the Triceratops, Dinonychus, and even Stegosaurus, all the A-list celebrities of the Mesozoic. So what's all this talk about missing dinosaurs? Shouldn't we be gawking over the amazing new fossil finds from China and South America? Absolutely, but not in this video, because folks, we have a mystery on our hands. Not so much a who done it, but more of a why done it. Let's start by taking a look at those dinosaurs I mentioned earlier. The T-Rex lived in the Hell Creek Formation, stretching across Montana, Wyoming, and the Dakotas. As for the Triceratops, same place, because of course it was. Rivals gotta do what rivals gotta do. And when we look at the rest of our dino A-listers, they all seem to be from the same general area. Which begs the question, did dinosaurs just love the Midwest, or is it more likely that this region was just really good at fossilizing them? Like most things in science, the truth is somewhere in the middle. Dinosaurs definitely roamed the entire continent, but the ones from the eastern US? That's a whole different story. But unfortunately, Mother Nature can be a jerk, and much of the evidence of their existence has been lost to time. So today, we're taking a look at the dinosaurs of North America and discovering what these forgotten creatures can teach us about dinosaur evolution. Don't forget to hit that like button and let's dive into this. Okay, first things first, let's set the stage. Back in dinosaur times, the Earth was basically going through a messy divorce. The supercontinent Pangaea, turns out it wasn't built to last, and eventually it split into two massive land masses, Gondwana to the south and Laurasia to the north. Now, the nice thing about having all your continents connected is that it makes travel a breeze. No passports, no layovers, and no getting trapped in the Spirit Airlines terminal for three whole hours just to find out your flight's been canceled. Dinosaurs could just walk wherever they wanted. But Mother Nature took one look at this free-range dino utopia and said, I can fix that. So temperatures rose and sea levels climbed, and before long, the northern half of Laurasia was split into two major land masses, Larmidia to the west and Appalachia to the east. And this, my friends, is where things get interesting. You see, when you take a bunch of animals and cut them off from each other for millions of years, some pretty funky evolutionary stuff starts to happen. Over in Laramidia, dinosaurs were locked in an evolutionary arms race to see who could develop the most over-the-top murder accessory. The carnivores developed larger skulls, stronger bites, and arms, actually, never mind the arms, and the herbivores, well, you get the point. Meanwhile, over in Appalachia, things were, um, let's go with less violent. Instead of reinventing the wheel, which I guess hadn't been invented yet, the dinosaurs over there seemed to adopt a more, if it ain't broke, don't fix it approach. Take a look at these Tyrannosaurs. Not only were they faster and more agile, but some of them even kept their long arms. Which, let's be honest, is a flex in itself. And the herbivores? Let's just say they were eating their vegetables. So while the western dinos were basically starring in Jurassic Fight Club, their Appalachian cousins were taking a let's run it back approach. And surprisingly, that worked out pretty well for them. In fact, thanks to these dinos we made some incredible discoveries. But before we get to that, we have a bit of a mystery on our hands. I don't know if you've heard, but dinosaurs are pretty popular. I hear they're even making a movie about them. Ever since the dinosaur renaissance of the mid 20th century, the number of new fossil discoveries has exploded. Scientists have been digging up dinosaurs everywhere. So here's the million dollar question. If we're finding dinosaur fossils all over the place, then why aren't we finding them here? Well, you see, there's a problem in this area. The fossils, well, they're kind of gone. Wiped off the map. Vanished, just like your motivation after January 2nd. In fact, there are so few fossils here that the ones we do find have gone through quite the incredible journey just to be discovered. But that's all for later. First, let's take a look at how fossilization actually works. Okay, so for step one, and this is very important, you have to die. Preferably in a way that keeps everything intact. Step two, get buried. Quickly. Ideally by mud or sand so that nature doesn't have time to, well, be nature. Then finally, step three, be very patient. And assuming nothing disrupts you for millions of years, congrats, now you're a fossil. Think of it as nature's version of a slow cooker. Sounds simple enough, right? Well, the problem is Appalachia sucked at all three. First off, the region was covered with dense forests and floodplains, so good luck getting buried quickly. But the real issue was the soil. The soil was acidic, meaning that even if nothing disturbed you, the minerals needed for fossilization likely would have dissolved before bones had a chance to fossilize. But let's say you were one of the lucky ones. Maybe you had the good fortune to croak in a nice swampy area where conditions were actually decent for fossilization. Awesome, except, oh wait, the Appalachian Mountains are literally one of the oldest mountain ranges on Earth, which means they've slowly been eroding away for hundreds of millions of years. Meaning that fossilization in Appalachia is like trying to keep a snowman alive in July. Odds are, it's not happening. But worry not, my friends, because despite all these challenges, we have managed to find a few fossils scattered throughout the area. And what better way to kick things off than with everyone's favorite murder chicken? 
the Tyrannosaurus. Right, so when looking at Tyrannosaurus, the first thing you have to understand is that these guys absolutely kill it when it comes to naming. You've got everyone's favorite, the King of Tyrants or Tyrannosaurus Rex. Then there's names like Moros and Trepidus, which translates to the Harbinger of Death, also pretty metal, as well as the Feather Tyrant known as Eutyrannus. And of course, we have these two. On the left, we have Dryptosaurus, whose name means Tearing Lizard with Eagle Claws. And on the right, we have Appalachiosaurus, whose name means Appalachian Lizard of Montgomery. Huh, not quite the dramatic flair I was expecting. Feels less terrifying predator and more local high school mascot. Still, despite the lackluster name, there's a whole lot we can learn from these two dinosaurs. So let's take a closer look at them. The first thing you'll notice is that unlike T-Rex, both of these animals have three fingers on their hands, which isn't unusual. After all, that's what we'd expect to see in those early Tyrannosaur ancestors. Only there's an issue here. These two aren't actually early ancestors of T-Rex. They lived at roughly the same time, which means that third digit should have been long gone. It turns out that neither of these dinosaurs have been discovered with their arms fully intact. So when scientists were trying to fill in the missing pieces of the skeleton, they looked at the long arms of Dryptosaurus along with the abundance of other ancestral Tyrannosaur traits and concluded they must have maintained their third finger as well. Which makes a lot of sense. After all, if you've got long arms, you're probably also using them more, so why not keep that extra finger? However, science moves forward, and later, a study of the shoulders revealed that the arm structure of these two beauties actually resembles a modern Tyrannosaur more than their ancestors. So, while it's still in question, the current consensus seems to be that these guys only had two fingers. Looks like you two are due for an upgrade, but it's not just the arms. Let's take a deeper look at both of these animals. In 1866, renowned paleontologist Edwin Cope discovered the remains of a massive theropod in what is today modern New Jersey. Cope is famous alongside his rival Marsh for their long-standing rivalry dubbed the Bone Wars. We've actually talked about their rivalry before. If you'll remember from my video on plesiosaurs, Cope suffered one of his most embarrassing moments when his rival Marsh had publicly pointed out that he had accidentally swapped the tail and neck bones on an elasmosaurus skeleton, an error that we certainly shouldn't look into and definitely wasn't anyone else's fault. But the joke's on Marsh, because despite that little blunder, Cope still got to name this newly discovered theropod, and name it he did, calling it Laylapse, after the mythical Greek hunting dog who never failed to catch his prey. Pretty cool, right? Or at least it would have been if an etymologist hadn't already used the name 70 years earlier for a group of mites. And, as you can imagine, the rules of taxonomy don't allow two animals to share the same name. So, Laylapse had to be renamed by the person who caught the mistake. And, unfortunately for Cope, oh no, not you again! But that's only one of our new dino friends. We still have to talk about this guy. Oh hey buddy, I like your friend there. This is Appalachiosaurus. Now, Appalachiosaurus might not have the same flashy backstory as Dryptosaurus, but it's still a fascinating animal. Unlike T-Rex, the thick bone-crushing juggernaut, Appalachiosaurus had a more sleek and slender build, suggesting it was a faster and more agile hunter by comparison. However, it might not be that simple. As I've mentioned before, fossils in Appalachia are rare, and the only specimen of Appalachiosaurus we found comes from a juvenile. And while there's still some debate over whether or not the juvenile T-Rexes we found were their own separate genus or just awkward teenagers, it does appear that the younger T-Rexes shared that similar sleek design. So then, why can't we say Appalachiosaurus went through a similar growth period? Well, until we find an adult, we really can't say for sure. But when comparing the teeth in the skulls of the two juveniles, the T-Rex skull is noticeably heavier and its teeth were stronger suggesting it was still in the process of growing into its massive noggin. But let me know what you think down in the comments. Now, as much as we love those giant carnivores, we have to talk about the her- oh my, what is that? This lovable beefcake is Hypsobema, or as I'm calling him, Humphrey. And as you can clearly see, he's been eating his vegetables. No, but seriously, what's going on here? I mean, hadrosaurs, or duckbills, were a dime a dozen in the Cretaceous period. And if we compare our friend Humphrey here to an average havasaur, one thing becomes crystal clear. He's big. Like, really big. But the question is, why? Well, one theory suggests that Appalachia might have lacked the giant sauropods we see in other parts of the world, and in their absence, someone needed to step up. So then, why not these guys? Go on, buddy, dream big. Now, being huge is cool and all, but there's just something special about those originals. This southern gen on the left is called Lophorothon, and while he's technically not a true hadrosaur, he does provide an interesting insight into their evolution. As for this lovely southern bell on the right, she's known as an Eotractodon, and unlike Lophorothon, she's a true hadrosaur. Wait a second, that's not fair! They both look like primitive hadrosaurs to me. Why do we have to exclude our friend here? Is it his hat? Oh no, this goes way beyond fashion sense, but it will probably make more sense if we compare their skulls. 
Eotrachodon's crest is packed full of nasal passageways, and if you know anything about hadrosaurs, you know that these get turned up to 11 in the later species, like Parasolophysis. Meanwhile, if we peek over at Lophorothon, his crest is basically just a solid chunk of bone. Good luck making honky noises with that. And then we get to the teeth, where we can clearly see they're the same picture. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not seeing it, they look identical to me. But apparently, it all comes down to chewing skills. Lophorothon, for example, could really only move his jaw up and down, while his cousin over there could move her jaw side to side in a chewing motion, allowing her to grind her food more efficiently. Pretty cool, right? It's just a shame we don't have more fossils to work with. Tell me about it. You wouldn't believe the kind of journey some of these fossils have gone through just to reach us here today. For example, take a look at this egg. Finding a dinosaur egg is always exciting because, hey, just what do you think you're doing? Breakfast. No, we don't eat dinosaur eggs. They taste terrible. And besides, this egg is pretty special. It was found in the Moorville Chalk Formation in an area that stretches across modern day Alabama and Mississippi. But here's the problem. The egg was found in Mississippi. Oh man, that is a problem. No, no, we love you, Mississippi. We love you, hotty toddy all the way. The issue is that during the Cretaceous period, this whole area would have been underwater. So then how did a dinosaur egg end up all the way over here? Maybe it came from a nest on land and due to erosion was transported to the new location. Not likely. If that were the case, we would expect the egg to be covered in foreign sediments, but it's not. In fact, the opposite is true. The sediment around the egg matches the material found throughout the area. So we can be pretty sure the egg was fossilized here and wasn't moved after the fact. Which means now we have to ask, how did it get here? Oh, I bet it was like the opening scene from that one dinosaur movie Disney made. You know the one, with those talking lemurs and oversized Carnotaurus? I love that movie! Maybe that's what happened here! The egg must have rolled out of its nest and then gracefully floated down the currents to its final resting place. Huh, I think you might be onto something, is what I would say if CGI was involved. Aw oh, man. While this scenario technically falls into the realm of, it's possible, there are a few issues with it. See, fresh eggs don't stay buoyant for very long, and while the surrounding salt water would have helped it float for longer, there's still a pretty glaring issue here. It's an egg, not exactly the sort of thing that survives a long distance journey. And this one, pretty well preserved. Plus, imagine it just drifting along while every marine predator in the area collectively decided, nah, I'm stuffed. It's not impossible, but let's be honest, it is a bit of a stretch. All right then, Mr. Smarty Pants, then what do you think happened? Oh me? No idea, let's see what this book says. According to this, some paleontologists hypothesize that one way the egg could have traveled to this location was by its mother, aww, who was dead. Oh. The idea goes that the pregnant mother might have met her untimely death near the bank of a river. As the carcass started to decompose, gases would have built up inside the body, causing the body to bloat and float away, traveling a vast distance. And as tends to happen with large chunks of meat drifting on the surface of the water, marine predators would have quickly taken notice. Somewhere along the way, pop! Out comes the egg landing in the exact spot we find it today. Now, there are a few issues with this theory, such as no signs of the mother or any other dinosaurs, but I chalked that up to predators doing their job. And as for why none of the predators ate the egg, by that point, it probably smelled like Satan's gym sock. And as crazy as this whole story sounds, it's actually how we found a ton of fossils from Appalachia. Who knows what else is out there? The dinosaurs of the eastern United States might not have had the same fossil friendly conditions as their western cousins, but the few that did survive the erosion of time and the occasional river rafting adventure have given us a rare peek into a world otherwise lost to history. From long darn tyrannosaurs to oversized hadrosaurs, the dinosaurs of Appalachia show us just how strange and fascinating evolution can be. But while these guys were busy being weird in isolation, other parts of the world had their own evolutionary side quests, some of which look like straight up dragons. But unfortunately, we're out of time, so I guess we'll have to leave the story of how Game of Thrones finally got its dinosaur for another video. Until then, I want to thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed this video and like to see more, please consider subscribing to my channel and don't forget to bring snacks.